In this latest episode of our Angling Legends series, I'm here with a, a man who, oh, 50 plus years ago, I remember reading the Guinness Book of Records, and in there, there was a, in the name of Dave Burr, who held, who held the record for the largest ever catch in the national championships at 76 pound nine. And I never imagined that all these years later I'd be sitting in his living room talking to him about that famous day and loads more in angling history. So, Dave, welcome. Help. Yes, thank you, John. Yeah. Um, how did you start fishing? What, 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 were, what were the early days like for you? I got interested when I was about 10 years old. And uh, in those days, you, as a young person, you could go out on your own and or with your mates without fear. Because I used to get on my bike and cycle down to the canal, which was two couple of miles away. And <clears throat> I'd, I'd acquired a little rod, um, having you know, gone through the cane situation. But I got a little rod and a reel, and we used to go down and we used to, three or four of us, sit there and catch gudgeon and roach and uh, perch. Um, Bream and things like that, you, they were unheard of to us. It was, and you were just, as long as the float was going under, the porcupine quill, that type of float, yeah. then you, you were happy. You, we were able to buy a few maggots from a little pet shop. About You go down and get three pennies of maggots, and, and that would sort of do you for a, a morning or yeah. afternoon. We're talking about sort of the late 40s, early 50s. Oh, this, early, yeah, yeah I, I, well... See, I was born in 38, so it would be about 48, 1948, yeah. that period. We've, we had a terrible winter in 47, which uh, destroyed everything. You, know, you wouldn't have gone fishing in that. You'd have walked on the canal that year. Yeah. Yeah. But um, after that, the weather improved, you know, thankfully. And for about 48, 49, that was when I, I started going fishing. Uh, I used to go down the river. Um, again, you'd only catch minnows and perch and, and maybe a, an odd little chub. But you, you, main, the main fishing was in the canal. Yeah. And how many clubs would there have been in the rugby area in, well, in, in that era? And, and how many members would they have had? Well, the, the, as I recall, the, the, most of the fishing on the canal was controlled by the rugby eyes at Walton. And uh, they would have had four or five hundred members, I would have thought. It's, you know, I can't quite remember now, but it, it was sizable, but not obviously in comparison to Coventry, who had thousands in, in yeah. and the BAA. Yeah. <coughs> but um, Coven uh, rugby also had another club, the Rugby Angling Association, who, who were more inclined to do match fishing than the other club. They didn't have any waters as such. So, uh, I mean, eventually they, would, they did amalgamate and form one, one club. But the rugby eyes at Walton, they used to run evening matches. And uh, because you used to meet people on the canal when you were going down as a young lad, they encouraged us to, one or two of us, to go along to their evening matches. They were Monday nights, I think they were. And uh, they were very well supported. If you, if you think, look at it, the situation now, and you could think that in those days, a Monday night match would attract probably 80, 90 anglers. And they'd all be spaced out all along the canal, all sitting on creels and sitting there with their little rod and reel because there's no poles or anything. So it was very basic fishing. And if you had a pound of fish, that was, wow, you know, that was as much as you could expect to catch. Yeah, yeah. nobody complained then about Oh, no, 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 there was no, no. I remember one, one, uh, later on in my, in my sort of junior career, I got, I, I won one of the evening matches outright, I had two pound, two ounces, I shall never forget it, and I went home all agog, I said, I'd won the top prize and I was only a junior, <laughs> so from there on, of course, that started that me That really yes. spurred you on? That spurred me on. And I got involved then with a, another angling club, the angling section, the British Legion. And they went out on a coach about every fortnight. So that, <laughs> there were only about 30 blokes. 
and I think there's only two or three of my age that actually was encouraged to go out with them. But it took me around lots of different waters, you know. We, we would go further afield to canals, like out Northampton Way or down south towards places like Hayford and places, you know, sort of you. And then um, you would end up your trip to the Ouse or the Neen. Uh, I even remember as a young lad going up to the Trent and being sort of mind blown about the pace of the water. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a great exercise in the sense that it taught me a lot about the, the fishing scene. So I became adept, you know. Yeah, so and of know. course, in between time, I'd been, been able to earn some money doing a paper round. And from that, because my parents weren't well britched, from that I was able to buy a little bit of gear and I ended up with a decent little rod and reel and what have you, so yeah. I built the tackle up from there. Yeah, we only ever had one of everything, didn't we, Dave? You well, know, yeah, you yeah, you, to... you only had one rod and yeah. one reel, and that was how you went along, yes. Yeah. Uh, because then you only had one method of fishing, really speaking, it was all float fishing. Yeah. Leisure was something you only resorted to if you went to the river, and it was in flood. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. My float rod was also my ledger rod. Had a little screw in the eye thing on the end and yeah, you could put a, well, a swing tip or a quiver yeah, that's tip. It, that's it. it. Was, yeah, one rod. Yeah, true old yeah. purpose, yeah. So you were getting into match fishing a bit. When yeah. did you decide that you'd like to sort of, if you could, get in the rugby team for the uh, well, All England? When well, I'd, I'd reached, what was it? I'd be about 18 and I'd qualify. I'd, I'd fish the rugby angling or the, well, no, I'd fish the, the newly formed association that became the Rugby Federation of Anglers. And I, because I was involved in the Isaac Walton Club, I obviously became part of the, the, newer, the new setup. And uh, they ran a series of trial matches, um, some on canal, some on river, and it, probably two river matches and five or six canal matches. And I qualified. In for the 1957 match on the seven, yeah, but, that was the uh, one that was flooded out in the end, wasn't it? Uh, I, I don't, re I don't really or know much. Flooded, uh, what's that no, look? Yeah, I think it was. I'll have to have a look. If, I'll have to have a look in John's book. Well, there was one it, of the matches on the seven <laughs> is it? in the fifties yeah. where the river was about oh ten foot up and it was one with a very low weight. I think yeah, that was I, the I, one. I can't recall the match because. What happened was that the secretary had failed to enter the team because he was new to the you know, setup and he, he didn't think he had to enter it. And of course, when it came to it, we'd got a team, but we weren't entering it. So, so there was the, me the dead, you know, thinking I was going to fish the national and, and I didn't. I always remember, because I used to go in, at that time I was working over in Coventry as a draftsman and... Uh, <laughs> I used to get called, because I was in Coventry, I used to make a point of going to Billy Lane's shop. And uh, I used to go, well, I went into Bill's shop when I, when I went to the technical college every once a week. Uh, and I went on the train, because we didn't have a car. So I went on the train and I used to walk to Billy's shop from the tech. And I was, used to go into, because he was in Much Park Street then. And... Uh, I remember talking to him about the seven, and and I remember then going and saying to him about that, you know, and he, he commiserated with me, bless him. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like God. Yes, he was. yeah. But, um, so that was my f first, but the following year, the team was entered, and I did qualify, and I fished 10 nationals for quite well, for about 17 years. Yeah. But um, early on, we didn't sort of feature. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until 65, really, that yeah. things took off. I Come remember... On, 65. I, what, I what about 1964? No, 1960... Who did you draw again? No, not 1963, I fished on the Gloucester Canal. Yeah. I drew in the awful basin right at the bottom end of the, of oh, the, at, of the at canal. Oh, at Burton or at Sharpness? It's, it's, uh, at the it's, the, it's the far end, it's the seven. The yeah, the it, Sharpness it, it end. It goes out into a big bay. It does. Oh, and it was a nightmare. We'd done all the practising on the normal canal. Yeah. With, you know, with the shelf down and deep water. Yeah. And then I was stuck in this basin with like a lake. <laughs> but it didn't do any good, and I had enough it's few points. Or... I weighed in, I think, but... 
Oh, it's only a, a low weight. Yeah. It wouldn't have fished. Didn't fish very well that match. That's did it? The only Roy Sims won the match from the the milk factory, factory swim, swim yeah. which was noted area anyway. And the, but the following year, it was on the seven again. And I drew down. It was the lower seven. I drew yeah. below Upton on a, for a big wide piece and all waggler fishing because you know. We didn't chuck feeders out and things in them days. We weren't allowed. Yeah. And it was difficult because you couldn't use catapults to put bait out. So no, you were, no catapults you were restricted to how far yeah. you could fish out. So yeah. it was all basic waggler fishing, you know, stick float and waggler. And uh, I was sat next to Roy Sims. Yeah, and, it in and, uh, and I, I beat him on that day. I, none, neither of us did particularly well, but I had more than him, and I was yeah. quite pleased with that. Yeah. And of course, then the following year was down in Somerset. It was uh, yeah, all changed. So what was the, what's the? I mean, it's one of the great national stories in, in my opinion. I mean, am I right in thinking you were late getting to your peg? Well, uh, yes, because in those days we didn't have fancy trolleys and things. But, and we carried a lot of bait. And I knew I was going to be faced with a reasonable walk wherever I drew. And of course, drawing the Sedgemore, and right in the middle of between the two entrances. So I had about 60 or 70 or 80 pegs to walk with kit. Yeah. Now, bearing in mind in those days, I had a, I had a big basket, big wicker yeah, basket. Yeah, big wicker basket. A, a relatively small hold all, because there'd be two rods in it. Yeah. at the most. Uh, I didn't bother with a brolly because you, you know, that was something you didn't need to carry. Yeah. And your landing net handle and a few bank sticks and what have you. And then on top of your keep net, on top of your basket, you put your keep net. You know, I had two that day. Yeah. And I'd also knocked up about eight to ten pound of ground bait ready. Yeah. Prepared. Be so that, that crumb ground, that mate, is, it, in those it, days. Oh, it'd be brown, brown, a mixture of brown and brown crumb with a bit of white just to bind just it. Just to bind it, yeah. And I had a lot of squats. I had about a gallon of squats, which I took all, a lot of the sand off. Yeah. So they were rel relatively neat. Yeah. They, that was a last minute job in the morning of the match. Yeah. So I was, got, I was carrying a fair bit of kit. So I'd got all this bait, prepared bait and everything else. And I'd, got, I'd set up an axle with two little wheels. They were only about, oh, I don't know, five or six inches in diameter on my tr on my basket. And I had a, like a bar, which I fixed to the back of the basket. And I was pulling this along with all this kit. And I got halfway up to my peg and the axle broke. So all of a sudden- Bet you didn't swear, eh? Uh, probably. <laughs> So all of a sudden I'm, I'm sort of stuck. So I had to, sh I got the, the, the basket, took the thing off the basket, carried it about 10, 20 yards, went back, fetched my hold all, went back and all, and I got, an, I think I'd got another bait bag as well with, a, with stuff in it. So I just worked the stuff up to the peg, bit at a time which was a bit of a disaster. But when I got to the peg, everybody else was all set up. I got about five minutes. So I started to put the gear together. Then the whistle went. So they're all going in and I'm looking at it and thinking, the only thing to do, I've got to put some feed in. Yeah. So although I wasn't actually ready, to, I hadn't got the, you know. Your rod gear, you set, got set focus up on properly. your ground bait. So the first thing I did was, and a couple of three handfuls of squat and threw them. Bear in mind, I'd been playing, I'd played a lot of cricket, so I was yeah. quite used to throwing. So I threw by hand as many squats as I could get into the swim. They went everywhere. But it, I didn't bother about that because it was creating a big area. Because we knew the bream would be in, in that. Somewhere on in, the, in, in, that, that, in that round. Yeah. And I wouldn't put any ground bait in because I wasn't sure exactly what line I'd be fishing. But yeah. these squats had gone in. So then I got myself sort of organised and set up. And I set up a 13 foot Marlborough Enterprise rod. <coughs> and being a bit commercial, I thought, oh, I'll put the Abu reel on. An Abu 506. 
So rail. I got an Abu reel and a Milbro rod. Because yeah. obviously we knew that we were in an area that could produce some fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I've, and I've got a, about a 4BB ducker, which was a, a quill float made by a guy in Coventry. Stevie Strong, I think he was called. But they were super floats. Billy Lane, was he, he used to rave about them. And they were caught, it was a, a bolster body on a quill, like an antenna. You know, what, what we would class now as a, as a waggler, I suppose. Yeah. But it was called a ducker for some reason. <laughs> I carried about four BB, which were all the blocks and then a couple of dust shot down the line. 12, a 12 hook loaded up with, no, it's not, no, tell a lie. I started off on about a 16 hook with a single maggot. Went in on that, put some ground bait in when I got where I could fish because it was a bit windy. Well, the wind had got up at the start yeah. of the match. And uh, first fish I caught was probably a little roach. So I carried on. And then gradually putting ground bait in and feeding the swim up, I started to catch bream. They were about two pound a piece, so nice size. Yeah. But the reel was playing up. I wasn't happy with it. It was, it seemed to be dragging and and it, the line wasn't flowing off right. So I did what the unthinkable really. I broke off. Yeah. I broke off above the float, so I kept the float and all that rig set up. I put a loop in the line on the end of that. Yeah. Can change the reel, put the Mitchell re Mitchell reel, an old Mitchell 300, yeah, which at yeah, that time was the best, one really. of the best reels. Yeah. Run that through the rings, and then tied the, in a, the little loop I'd made above the float, tied the line to it, and I was back in business again. So I'd lost time. Yeah. But nothing was really ha not, nobody was really going berserk. So, so I just carried on, and uh, from there on it was sort of. Steadily catching fish. Filled up one keep net. Was brave yeah, enough the to think, think, think small keep nets in those days, weren't they? Not like they, they weren't as, no, they weren't that big. Yeah. So I, I filled up the one and then I got the other one out and popped that in and, yeah. and set I could see Colin Clough so, next door yeah, to me. Yeah, for those who don't he, know, rugby he, drew next to Coventry. Drew next Coventry with the book his favourite. That's right, without a doubt, yeah. And I, we drew next to them. And Colin Clough was below me, he was struck yeah, he, he was catching. Was, but he, 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 he got was a, probably their least experienced angler. He got he got a muddle. It was his first, was absolute, I think it was his first national. It could well be. You know, and he was Colin was, with... He was a bundle of nerves. But, so, you know, I mean, rightfully, I suppose I should have. But I wasn't, I'm not the nervy sort of bloke. So, <laughs> so I just yeah. carried on. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. the crowd built up behind you. So what, you, sort of, what sort of crowd would the, I mean, would the be? Oh, I right? think there was two or three hundred behind us because yeah. the word had gone round. And pretty much everybody was aware that. Uh, the D that this would D be section, the, um, D section, um, middle of D section was where the fish were likely to be. Yeah. And I think we walked them, to be honest with you. I mean, I walked from one end and people walked from the other yeah. end, and those. 10 pegs in the middle section all produce good weights yeah. and I just happened to catch more than the rest of them in that area. Yeah. In effect I won the match but I also I, I really just won a small match of 10 pegs <laughs> yeah. in that section. Yeah. So what was the weighing like? What do you remember about the weighing? Cause that must yeah the weighing was, 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 was... Well who was, was weighing that, first? Because you, you, you were Colin. Um, do you know, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure now. I, I, that's something I, I, I don't recall, to be honest with you. Yeah. You're all agog, and I've got people all around me, so you didn't really know, and all of a sudden the scalesman's rolled up. Yeah, there have been several so, weighings. Well, yeah, yeah. The scales, well, the scales weighed only up. weighed up to about £10 or something yeah. like that. So you were, Maybe even eight. So Maybe the old room and yeah. eight was weighed to £8. Yeah, I'm not sure what these weigh, but there was quite a while. Yeah. I'll tell you a little story about and, that. And, yeah, John so Essex, when he caught his carp in, in 75 National, they hadn't got scales no, big enough. No, to, I saw that. Yeah. Big enough yeah. to, to, to weigh them. <laughs> and they had to go back and... and um, 
get some scales from a butcher's or something. Oh, sure. John had missed his coach <laughs> to get back, and he was worried he was going to be disqualified. And, you know, there's yeah, the well, sort of thing, yeah, but he did, even though it was their fault not having the scales. But, well, it's yeah, like, this so, proves it, it, the fact that in, that in those days, people didn't catch big weights. No. You know, even on a national, you know, scales weighing up to ten pounds was considered adequate. Yeah. But all well, of a sudden, you know, it, it was, almost always was. So yeah. There was me. I fetched one keeping that out and I go in and put out. Only put in about three fish under the stone, yeah. three or four fish. Yeah. So it did take a while. Yeah. And then fetch the other net out. And there they go. Then. And then, of course, I've, there's a picture of me. I got upstairs that if, if there's all people. I'm sitting there and I've got this. Horrible black oil skin thing because it was raining, and it's <laughs> a really tatty thing it was. And I'm my hair's down, I'm soaking wet, <laughs> and there's all the people around you, and there's it's, it's, yeah, and you're being weighed in. And you know what, Colin weighed in. Yeah. Colin weighed yeah. 55. 55. And yeah. so 65, 75. That gave you a 20 pound advantage it's over over Cobbs. That's right. Yeah. 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 Cobbs you made were a little bit, but they were still behind at the at the end of the day. Yeah. And so not only did you win the individual rugby fed, who I think were about oh, 101 wow. with the bookies. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did well at the bookie on that day. Can you remember who it was? Uh, the bookie? Uh, who was uh, there the was Jim Wooding was one. Um, oh, uh, not. Bill, Bill Not, not Bill Not, Bill, Bill, yeah, Bill, Bill Not, Bill, Bill, not, yeah. Bill Not, and, and Wooding with the, with yeah. the bookies, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a nice sack money off them. Eh? I bet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they generously paid up with what was smiling. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't see them pay up because it was all, you, you received it in the post, I think, yeah. really cool. I mean, funny yeah. enough, just going back to John's book, there's quite a few cases of bookies running off with the, uh, running off with the money um, oh. on, on, several, on several occasions. Yeah. National champions never got yeah. paid I've, I've started the book, but I'm struggling. I, I, <laughs> I'll get so far, then I have to put it down. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating, isn't it? Oh, I, I love it. Yeah. You know, and yeah. Uh, um, yeah, the book is the book is thing is, is fascinating. Sadly, sadly gone, of course. That's but, wrong. Um, so yeah, what can you remember about uh, getting back to the head? You had to carry you well, all yeah, year well, back. Course, it was, oh, you know, no, no, no. I was fortunate, really, because quite a few of the, the we had quite a few people travel with us. The team went down the coach. The night before, yeah. we stayed overnight in a B and B place, and uh, we went from that to, to the draw, obviously. And then, of course, you, you shipped out on the coaches from the draw to each section. So, quite a few. We had quite a few supporters come down with us. We got the three reserves yes. who who travelled anyway, yeah. plus a few people who wanted to come and just be there yeah, on the day. So, yeah, that's how it was. So. Yeah. They were all behind me, of course. So I'd got some friends, really, in the, in the group behind me, all cheering me on as I was catching the fish. I could hear them. Go on, Dave! <laughs> and then, uh, so when it came to walking back, somebody had grabbed me basket and used the strap and put it over the shoulder, and somebody had got me hold all, and, uh, oh, and I'd... There was something else. Oh, and my little bait bag. So I really, walk, I just walked back with people all around me talking about it. Well, it so it, a, it was a lovely walk back. It must have been the most <laughs> wonderful experience of well, my lifetime. Yes, it, it? you, it was, you it still can't. Now you still don't know. True. Because True, you, you've weighed in, yes, but you have to remember that there was the hunt spill. Yeah. And. The, all right, there was the Crips River and there was another little drain here. Yeah, the Crips River but didn't fish very well. No, no. Well, I think it was Bill Lane drew the Crips River. Bill Lane drew, um, drew yeah, that, poor yeah, old yeah, Bill. Bad answers, I so, think. But you, you, you've, not, you've done well and you know you've done your bit, but you're not 100% certain. No, because you know, like that, somebody You can't say else you've could. won because no. you don't know. No. You've got 12, 12 1,300 people. Yeah. There was 112 teams, I think. Yeah. So there was 1,300 people. On the bank. Now, you know, yes. you, you, you want to think it, yes. Yeah, you're, you're, you're hopeful, hopeful, but you're not. But you but don't you're not know. No, the course, the yeah. first indication I had was got, I got back to the headquarters and with the coach dropped us off and I got off the coach 
and I was standing in, in a group of lads and who should come up to me but Billy Lyon with his hand out. He'd already been in, he, he knew. And he said, yeah, he perhaps had and, it, and, to he, the, uh, NFA he, and I remember it vividly. He says, you young bugger, he says, I've been trying to do that for years. He says, well done to you. And I always think, always remember that. My hero was Billy. Yeah. Wow. But uh, so then I, I knew, and of course, and, but yeah. we didn't know the team result, of course. No. But we obviously, with uh, Skipper was a guy called Harry Hurst. And, uh, oh, I mean, the guy was, he was getting on a bit, Harry was, but he was a good angler. And he was over the moon, of course. He had to go up and collect his, the big NFA championship trophy. Okay. So it was a wonderful day and many memories. And there you yeah. go. So what time did you ride back in uh, Rugby? Oh. Early hours of the morning? Um, or? I, it was late. It was late, yeah, because we had, I mean, from, up from there and a coach. Uh, I remember the coach dropped me off at the house. So that was uh, a bonus. Yeah. Um, and, and I can remember going to the door and, and the wife coming to the door with uh, my daughter, who was one and a bit, and uh, I got, no, she was, she, that's right, she came to the door with my daughter. And, uh, oh, and came with, no, no, my daughter was, sorry, my daughter was three. And my, my son, my new son, my latest addition, who was born in 63, he was two. She came to the door with them and, and cause she'd all, I'd already phoned and said, well, yeah. yeah. But, uh, so that was it, there she was to greet me. I don't know what time it was, be late. <laughs> be late. But bless her, she stayed up. Yeah, wow, wow. Yeah. And so of course in those days, the top six teams, I think nominated an angler to fish for England. That's right, yeah, yeah. And so I assume that there was, uh, Ruby automatically nominated you with that. Yes, any, yeah, I got, uh, I got the nomination. Any internal politics. Yeah, 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 I got the nomination and uh, that was a strange experience. In yeah, so tell ways. me about fishing for, you know, there's not that many people that have fished for England and you're, and you're one of them. So. That's right, yeah, it was, it was, uh, obviously. What's, what's your a, memories of a that, very, that whole occasion? A very proud, a very proud moment to be able to, you know, be there on the day, and, and Bernard Donovan, who was the Coventry, he was our manager. Yeah. And because uh, <clears throat> there was, uh, I, I can't remember all the team, but there was Colin Clough, obviously from Coventry. Yeah. Who I became quite friendly with Colin. In fact, we still see one another strangely enough on the water we fish. Mm. And uh, there was a guy called Terry Gardner from Gloucester. I think it was Neil Mumford from Nottingham. That's right, or Derby, I'm trying to think. Maybe. Derby, yeah, Nottingham, right. that way. Yeah, I yeah. think he might have been Derby, yeah, yeah. Cause no, it's, yeah, you know, because he's the only mum for to fish for England, mm. isn't he, Ray? I don't think Ray ever fished officially mm. no, um, no, no, he, for, no. for England. And there was, I'm not sure who the other guy was, there was, there was a guy called Liscard, who came from the Yarmouth, the Norfolk area, but I'm not sure whether he actually was a reserve or not, so... I'm a bit sketchy on that one, yeah. but and I can't even pick it up from the results that I've got. So, yeah. but anyway, we it was we arrived the day before. Well, can, look, long story, but well, before we get there, let me just say this: that in those days there was no sponsorship for the international team. We all, you know, we, we had a blazer given us yeah. and we were paid, on the day, our accommodation overnight that we stayed in some, uh, like a holiday camp, um, that was paid for. But um, I don't think we even got expenses for travel. So you had to sort of fund it yourself to a degree yeah. and buy all your bait, of course. So it was... You, you, did you go and practice and stuff, Dave? I, mean, I, went, up, it seriously, I, I went up on a practice. Uh, I don't think... I don't know whether the others did, actually. I think Terry had been up, but I went up and practiced, and I stayed in my car. I actually slept over in the car. I hadn't got a lot of money, you know, and I... And I although I'd done well in the National, but 
I'd got a shop that was growing and the children that were coming on and, yeah, and I was only, uh, although I got yeah. a business that was, I wasn't earning much money out of it and, and I was a draftsman so anyway rather than try and stay overnight anywhere I drove up, had a day's fishing and I got a, I had bought a big Zodiac car, a state car from my winnings in the National so I just bedded down in that and then fished the following day. And then the only other practice we had was the day before on the on the actual match. But um, the day of the match was oh, most weird because uh, none of the Continentals have keep nets. So the, the, the Federation, the NFA, was supposed to provide every, all of them with a keep net. Well, they, they just asked all the local people to bring a keep net. And, well, honestly, some of them, they were little keep nets like this. Yeah. And oh, some wow. had got no bank sticks. And, oh, it was, a, it was really quite... And the draw for this World Championship was done on the top of a boot, on the bonnet of a car. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> honestly, it, it was quite <laughs> embarrassing, really. I mean, they got the sort of presentation worked out quite nicely. You know, Major Halliday was all there and there were all the yes. hierarchy. Yeah. But when it came to the actual match, I, I was very disappointed. But, um, of course, some interesting teams, you know, there'd be a West Germany and a Czechoslovakia. Yeah, countries yeah. that aren't sort of on the, on the map of Yugoslavia. Oh, that's right, yeah. Um, you know, they were all over. Yeah. probably... A whole variety of yeah, teams, yeah. yeah. What the heck are they on about? Um, <laughs> you know, where, where are those countries? Um, and I assume not much representation from Eastern Europe? No. The Russians? And oh, no, there? no, I don't think so. No. 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 It's, um, there was Italians and the French yeah. and they were sort of yeah. a few Spanish, I think. And of course, but, it was the French uh, that dominated. Well, the, the French, uh, yeah, they, 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 it suited them. They'd chosen the Thurn of all rivers, which really speaking was not a good choice because we were on a line limit year. You see, not everybody remembers this. No, tell us about no, that. No, uh, modern anglers wouldn't realise. No, because what the because the, the continentals all pole fished, so and the longest poles in those days were probably around about seven or eight metres, because carbon fibre hadn't been introduced. So we were all using fiberglass poles, and they were quite heavy. So eight metres would probably be as much as what they can handle. So if they went, if we went on a water that our expertise at long range waggler fishing would be beneficial, then they were lost. They couldn't compete. So what they did every other year, we had to fish to a line limit of 15 metres and that was all the amount of line you could have on your reel. <laughs> now the fern I suppose in some ways suited us in, on, on a line limit year but it was still restrictive. You know you could cast out but if there was a bit of pull on the river before you knew where you are you'd, you'd lost your line. Yeah, yeah. So the guys on the pole would, they were probably better suited to it. So it was a bad choice of venue, really. I mean, we, they should have took us on a bit of flowing water that we could have fished close yeah. and, and run down with the 15 yeah. metres. But they chose the, the third, which is relatively slow yeah. and, you know, hardly moving. But uh, there you go. It was, a, it was interesting. But we've, we ended up uh, sixth overall as, as a team, which was, I suppose, credible in, in the light of the system then. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, Terry Gardner did well, he was third. I ended up 11th and I think the others were, were down, down, down a little, yeah. down a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Were you the captain then, Dave? I was my captain, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was an honour, to be captain of the England team and to be at the, you know, ahead of the Absolutely. The, the table. Not many people really. can say that. No, no, that. that's right, being no. captain of England. Yeah. 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 But it was it was memorable in some ways, but not in others. Yeah. So there yeah. you go. That's 
<laughs> that was a fight, yeah. another fight yeah. out the so way. So it was always going to be a bit downhill then, really, from being England captain and um, well, yeah, a, a, a uh, national I mean, championship record holder. What else was that? Uh, well, yeah, exactly. You know, well, what, what else did you hope to achieve, and and where did your match fishing career go? Well, you, you, would, you, would, you would hope to sort of do win a national again. Yeah, uh, there was always a, a sort of. Um, it would have been nice to win a, a river championship because in those days we had some massive river championships. The Great Ouse Championship was uh, on the Relief Channel and down that way that used to embrace 1400 anglers. The Dean Championships would be 500, 550. Uh, the Seven Championships were, were big. They, they were sort of probably a couple of thousand even on the yes. Seven. And um, Birmingham AA had an even well, bigger match. Oh, the Birmingham BAA match was 5,000 used to fish in. I think that's about right, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, uh, section, that, sections that of 500. Oh. Yes, yeah, it's know, enormous right? now. Yeah. But uh, of course, over the years, it's all changed now. It, that a lot of waters couldn't handle the big events like that. No. So, let's see where we've gone. But um, my aspirations were. Uh, I suppose having reached those accolades was to just keep trying winning matches, I suppose, yeah. really speaking. And I, I went through a, a, a different spell after the, uh, after the Worlds. Uh, I, I left my uh, job as a draftsman and joined uh, Milbro as a representative on the road. Um, I spent three years with them, which was enlightening for me from the point of view of my own business, which I ran with my father-in-law. Um, which is Banks and Burr Fishing Tackle. This was the Banks and Burr Fishing Tackle, yeah. which we started up in 1961. Um, that came about basically because um, it was difficult to get good bait in rugby. And Reg, my father-in-law, he used to work in Coventry, quite close to Billy Lane's shop in Much Park Street and every Friday he used to go into the shop and get his bait and of course he was bringing bait that was far superior to, you know to compete against us on, on a Sunday in yeah. the matches his bait was far superior to ours and I got him and one or two of the other lads got him to bring some for, for us so Friday night we used to go around to Reggie's house and pick up the you know th no Thursday night you used to go around and take your tins you know, your maggot tins and tell him yeah. what you wanted, a pint of this and half of this and what have you. <laughs> and uh, of course, we, know we didn't have casters in them days. No, they, they, came, they, a bit they, they came, they were just on the verge. Yeah, Benny, Benny Ashley, I think, about 1956. Yeah, yeah, first yeah. With them, Bless him, I wish he hadn't done that. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why later. Yeah, go on. But um, no, so th Reg was bringing this bait into rugby and me being me, I suppose, I thought, well, I got involved then. Uh, I used to go around to Reggie's every Friday night. He got a very nice daughter who I took to, <laughs> and we, we started to go out, and eventually, of course, I, I did marry her. Yeah. But prior to that, um, Reg and I decided that we, we should develop our selling bait, so his shed at the bottom of his garden was, was made into a little emporium, and we used to dr dr drive on a Thursday night, Go and collect maggots from a place called Buckingham Bait Farm, which was about a 30 mile trip down that the A5. Was the Maggot King, Arthur. Um, Arthur no, Bryan. no, no, it was well, an, originally. Um, it? I think this guy called was Peachy. Right, and maybe he took over from yeah, Arthur. Yeah, could have, could have. No, there was another one down there. Was, ah, because yeah. Arthur Bryant won the national end. No, there was another in one. No, the one I that we dealt with was the Buckingham Bait Company. And we used to drive down there and come back with the maggots. And, Pinkies and things, and they, the lads used to come round on a Friday and a Saturday, and and we'd got no fridges or anything, so you were sort yeah. of reliant on them. Not, yeah, we, being used, fresh. we used to put pinkies in bags, cloth bags, yeah. Hessian bags, you know, so that because they climb everywhere, and we had a few <laughs> incidents of them, but but no, it was it was we got going and we got rod licenses for them, and we got just got a little bit of tackle and managed to acquire. Yeah. And uh, that was, we, well, I, we decided then it was time to, we had a proper establishment. And I encouraged him <laughs> to leave his house where he was, move into the next road, further up the road, 
to a house that had a shop front, shop at the front. And it was a bigger house as well. So he, just, he was all agog for that. So he moved in there and I was still courting his daughter. And uh, we opened the, uh, we opened the shop in, uh, oh, we opened the shop in 62. That's right, in six, 61 was the year I got married to his daughter and we were still doing this bit with the bait. And then in 62, we moved in, he moved into the shop and we, we had a small loan and bought a bit of gear, about 250 quid was I think we had to start the shop with. <laughs> so what shelves in there, there was still fish on them and cups and things, and, but we started and uh, it went on from there. So we, so we started off with a minimum of, of tackle and uh, we actually, we'd, we'd changed our bait supply. We, were, we went over to a guy called Albert Sharp in Coventry. Because in, in those days there was lots more tackle shops than there are now. And Coventry had got three main shops, well four maybe. Um, there was Bill Lane, there was uh, Ernie Smallman, there was Albert Sharp and there was another guy called Pete Roosevelt on the outskirts of the town, all selling bait. But we knew, I knew Albert quite well and we, he'd agreed that he, he, he had a good supply of bait. So we used to go over there on a Thursday night and collect a bit of bait from him. And eventually, of course, the shop got busier and busier and we, we were able to get a, a delivery, which when I went on the road, I just met Harold Greenway in Birmingham and he put me onto his Maggot man from uh, Don Bait, uh, Don, yeah, Don, 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 Don Bait, I think. Yeah, it was. up in Yorkshire. Yeah, up in it? Yorkshire. Yeah. The, the Yorkshire Maggot Man. Yeah. And uh, they were big, big maggots, they were. It was always good stuff from Yorkshire. Yeah. Wasn't it? Squats <laughs> you must have got from around the Lee area, that's where they tended to breed. Well, those, we had they? squats delivered by, by rail. Strangely enough, they all came from up north. Yeah, yeah. pick well, them we up used, at Rugby Station. We used to pick them up at Rugby Station. Yeah, that um, they were. All, they've always been a problem. They have because a lot of the breeders don't want to know. They they keep keep shy of them. But, yeah, um, I think they're hard. I, mean, I don't know much about them. But no, you need they're, a they're, high they're, temperature. No, and we don't even sell them now. They've disappeared. So for us, some of the canal areas are still using them. Yeah, and. They're still available, we, we could yeah. buy them, but we'd... Yeah, my favourite bait, I think, but uh, that's <laughs> well, another story. That's, than, that's right, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the shop got got uh, got going slowly, and yeah. that was, say, 62 we opened that. 65 was obviously a boost, because, of you know, I was still fishing regularly on a, on a Sundays. I uh, had a very tolerant wife, uh, and I was still doing okay, picking up money. 63 out a good year on the club levels, won a lot of trophies, and so it's, uh, and then after that, you were looking at the bigger matches, of course, after the national, there was all the river matches. I had a third on the Great Ouse Championships. The, uh, I was runner up on the Neen Championships. Um, I won the Toaster Open, that was a... That was a big canal match. That was a big, 400, too, 400 right? fish that, yeah. Yeah. Had everybody at that one, Billy Making, Ian Eaps, they all came down to that one. Yeah. But Murray, I drew, drew a good peg again, of course, you have to, don't you? Yeah. And uh, I had sort of got chub. Yeah. There's always more and, than uh, one winning, potential winning <laughs> peg in the well, match, I, I think. But, but, but yeah. no, I, I think is, I suppose it gave me the opportunity and I was one to grab it. And yeah. That, that's what helped me. But um, that does the use River Championship. I think Ivan won that. I've got a feeling John Essex might have run second. I'm not sure. I remember John doing well, but I'm not exactly yeah. certain of that one. Yeah. I know I was third with about forty pound of bream off the channel. But um, then I won a Coventry Major down at Hayford. Another canal match. Yeah. That was another big one. Yeah. That was two, three hundred, something yeah, like that. Because the thing of it so. then, people fish different rivers and canals pretty much oh, every yeah. week, didn't well, they? they didn't it, I mean, stick to one venue. Yeah, you, one week I'd be on the Ouse, another week on the canal, another week on the Trent, another week on the Seven, mm. then back on the Neen, and then back on the canal. You, yeah. you, you got. Yeah, you think the a standard lot of, of anglers was sort of higher? Well, I think it was quite high in the t top of level. 
in the top level, basically because of fish such a variety. Yeah, so there's probably like 500 anglers who, yeah. who could have fished for England. That's right, absolutely. And there probably isn't Absol 500 now. No, but, no. But, yeah, it's, some people it's, might disagree it's, with that. It's got specialised now. Yeah. You have people who are specialists on a water. They only, you know, you know, they go to these sort of lake complexes, don't they? And they, they become specialists at that particular place. Yeah. And this is what's happened. So yeah. they're not, they wouldn't, half of them wouldn't know what a stick float was or how to push a stick float through the river because they're all now on the pole and it's all carp and it's all arm bending stuff, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah. But um, well, I had something to say. I, had some good results and I remember winning the, the Dot Roller Cup at, on the Grey Twos at St Neots and uh, that was that was a, a nice a nice win because it was very competitive and, a, and a quite a, an even length of river but I had more than the rest, I had some bream again. Brilliant, yeah. <laughs> so rugby never won the national again but you were, no, we, you, we, you, you were we challenging at the time. so too. so close. In 1975, on the Neen, we were well used to the Neen, and I, I, I skipped the team that year, and I got a good group of young anglers, that uh, really keen young young men, um, and very capable. And we drew it. I drew them an end peg, which was Ooh, always a bit yes. of a help. Because you had oh, all that, of that the was a help. It, it, Oh, that it, was it, a help. Yeah. So you had MPEG on every section. Yeah. And uh, we all did reasonably well in our sections. We had, we had one, I think we had a section winner. And uh, some two, two or three high placings. And the rest of us were sort of middle of the road. I should have done better than I did. I, I'm, I'm always convinced myself of that. And I know another chap, Hubert Noah, who, who also fished in the world from rugby, um, following the uh, success of being fit on the Witham. And uh, Hubert actually missed his net with a fish. And at the end of the count up on the day, we were 11 points adrift of Birmingham. And Birmingham won the Birmingham match. Birmingham won the match, and we were 11 points adrift. We thought we'd done it, we really did. But they came up with. Well, when it was uh, on the day, we, we, there was a gap of 11 points. Wow. When it was collated over the, the, somebody checked all the results, it came out that Birmingham, in actual fact, had been credited with 10 points too many. Ooh. So in actual fact, the difference between rugby and Birmingham was one point. So any of us could have had one more, more fish. fish and we'd have been champions again. And when you consider the size of the rugby team, and, and the Rugby Federation against all the big outfits. That was an outstanding achievement. It was an outstanding, because that That's Birmingham a, side oh, was, no, was, awesome. was hand-picked. It was, oh, you know, no, no. A, a Smith, a Giles, oh, a Asher, and Lloyd Davis, Max Winters, people, Lloyd oh, Davis. Oh, no, that was a tremendous you know, team. I, mean, you know, I, I think yeah. Mark Downs yeah. was yeah. reserved yeah. that year. And, That's right. and, and, oh, no. and Mark was fishing for England within two or three That's years. Right, yeah. so you actually oh, that was a tremendous the, team. We pushed them. the strength of that side. We pushed them. And you pushed them. Yeah. Well, that was, that, that was the last success we had. Uh, and the following year, I, I think I was still a skipper again. I can't remember now. We're on the Trent. But we're on the, the Trent. Year, the, the hot and and there was about see. three of us, three of us, that really put an effort in on the Trent. Because obviously, having had the success the previous year, we were looking to, have, you know, carry on the success. <laughs> and... What, quite a few of the lads, knowing that the second division, remember we got two divisions by yeah. now, was on the ooze, which was their stamping ground. I got these young chaps, you know, all aching to get on, 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 their, on their river. And they didn't really so put any already effort Already people they are did starting not, to think about, they did about not, strategy <laughs> rather than doing trying yes, to do the best. They thought, well, we, if we're on the hood, we stand a chance of winning that. We've got no chance on the Trent. So they didn't try. And I, well, I might be wrong to say that, but they certainly didn't put the effort in. Yeah. And we were actually relegated, which was a real downer. Yeah, and, that hurt, didn't and it? The following year, of course, they were back on the ooze, and we didn't win, but they did enough to get back into the 
top level. Yeah. But by that time, my business was starting to take off and that was the last national I fished. I said, right. enough's enough. Yeah. I, I was disappointed with the, with the way it went and I was finding it more and more difficult to practice. The shop was getting busier. I, I was now full time in the shop. I'd left Milbro in uh, 71 and went full time in, in the business. So that, you know, I've got a growing family. So one thing and another, and I, I yeah. decided that, you know, enough. Yeah. I don't, because I don't, you set your standards I very high. Yes, I done me wrong, and yeah. I still fish matches, yeah. but but to a lower denomination, and you know, yeah. just, just enjoyed the fishing more. Yeah. Put it that way. Yeah. In the tackle shop, well, when would you say was the the glory years, if there was such a thing in the tackle shop? <laughs> so, certainly not the last ten, anyway. So. Well, no, no, when, no. You know, when could you make a decent living in the tackle trade? Oh, if ever? I, we've always made a, we've always made a living. Um, I mean, there was a time in, sort of in the nineties where I'm employed. Well, I, I got my my son came into it yeah. full time. I had another full time man. I used to have part timers come in on Saturday. Um, then I had the, the one chap that I'd introduced into the business in the 80s because of his trout fishing expertise, because that had, that had, Drake had opened and we got yeah. more trout angling. Um, so Brian, Brian left me, uh, well he retired, he yeah. was his retirement age. So I introduced another, another guy, um, Simon, he came in and, and helped us run the shop and, and we had another full-time carp angler type shop came in part-time he was doing he was doing three days a week we've got quite a team of people really it was yeah. carton myself it was uh simon there was um, another lad that used to come in oh that's right we had one came in on monday to wednesday and then the carp lad used to come in at the end of the week so it was, we were buzzing in that was a good time in the 90s i think yeah that was when it was sort of booming. Yeah. We were selling a lot of bait, a lot of maggots and stuff. You know, when you're talking around about, we were ravaging sort of 80, 90, 100 gallon of maggots a week. Yeah. Now you're looking to do 15. Completely yeah. changed. So it's gone full circle in that yeah. respect. I mean, uh, have you found the last few weeks, um, was since fishing's come back after coronavirus, what do you think? Well, it's been a boom. I, I mean, I think that, the coronavirus is devastating for, for for everybody, and it's certainly ruined a lot of businesses. But fortunately, I think we've survived because um, golf's done well, cycling's yeah. done well, because you know sold loads of bikes because yeah. people are encouraged yeah. to go on out on a bike, uh, and and fishing's come back yeah. because it's a solitary sport. Yeah, you know, yeah. You, and you're outdoors, and it's something that and people have got time. Yeah. So they were able to have a go. Is so, it people? Is it new people coming in, spending money? No, or is it, no, or is it no, people I, that no. Have maybe haven't been for no, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. What do you think? Dave? I think, although I mean, I'm not in there all the while now to see exactly what's going on, but I've got a good idea that mostly it's people that fished years ago have gone away from it and have come back to it. They've still got a bit of gear and they've dragged it out and they've topped it up with the new bits and what have you. But I don't think we've actually got too many what you call new punters for it. Yeah. And I worry that when this coronavirus thing settles down and hopefully disappears, that um, I think, well, maybe we're going to lose quite a few. They'll go back to their old ways, mm. you know. <coughs> but we don't know. We, we, it's all in the air, isn't it? Well, exactly. It certainly we're better off than we were a year ago. I think. Well, I think is. yeah, it's I mean, definitely been a, a, a boost. Yeah. Um, you, like you said, that the rod license sales have gone up. They've gone up by about yeah. fifteen percent, yeah, which yeah. takes us back to about two thousand and fifteen yeah, in terms yeah, of yeah. the total number of anglers. It'll, so. it'll never go back. I, I can remember the days when we used to deal with well over a thousand people a week through our little shop. Yeah. Now you're lucky to see 250, if, and that's a big week. Yeah. <coughs> There's a lot of online shopping going on now. Yeah. That's changed things from a trade point of view. Um, carp fishing's changed 
changed it. The match scene now has changed, you know. Got it's all pellet and yes. and, and yeah. fancy ground baits and yeah. um, it, it's. Yeah. Our ground bait rack used to consist of a rack with brown crumb, fine, medium and coarse, white crumb, fine, medium and coarse. We used to put a colouring, a yellow colouring, into some white, white and that was yellow ground bait, it would be a medium yellow, uh, we probably did a fine yellow as well, and that was about the end of it. Or oh, perhaps a few bags of Kestrel. I think they were about the only company that was actually doing a yes. bad ground bait. Yeah. I look, I look in there now and there's whole racks of hundreds of different types of ground baits. <laughs> <laughs> it's as if every species that swim has got a bag of ground bait. It, it, it seems that way, doesn't it? It seems that way. It's a complete yeah. change. I mean, uh, you must have had some good anglers. Um, come into the shop over the years and one of the things I always like to do for a bit of fun is is put people on the spot a bit and uh, see who the, the sort of who do, you, who do you rate as you know in your, it, as the best 10 day you've either it could be the best 10 anglers you fish with or the best 10 anglers that have sort of been regulars in your shop no, choice is because yours because of where we are we, we we don't get a lot of what you call uh, really top anglers dare I say this in rugby <laughs> <That's it. laughs> <laughs> but yeah. so we've got we've got some good lads definitely yeah uh, there's one at the moment that shines is Kevin Falwell he he does extremely well you know he, yeah. he's in the vets team he, but yeah. he's, he's he'd be pleased to be but, calling a lad he must be knocking on well, 70 he, he is he's getting on that way yeah yeah, yeah, yeah Kevin's yeah. getting there now but you know it's, yeah over the years but, I mean Kevin would obviously be one from this area I really Rate, you know, rated as yeah, well. yeah, yeah. There's Hubert, Hubert Noah, who I'd mentioned earlier. He he still does a bit of canal fishing, yeah. Um, but not you don't hear of a lot about what his success is. So he doesn't fish any big matches no, that, that I'm aware really, of. No, but he still but um, so overall, if I but, if I yeah. look at the, if, there's one angler that we used to see in the shop a lot that I've always had a lot of time for was Jan Porter. Yeah, the man Jan, in red. Jan the man, yeah, the, the man in red. Because he used to sell ground bait. I think Vandenine. he I think he did the van the van the van ground bait. So he used to he used to get him in the shop. Yeah. And and Jan and I got to know one another quite well. And we used to meet on the river anyway. Yeah. So that that was always somebody I've always yeah. had a high regard for. And he spread his wings, he went down on the Avon. Of course he moved to Eversham eventually. And but he came he became a a sort of a specimen hunter. Uh, yeah. he, he liked his big fish fishing. Yeah, but he was, well, he was a the lovely train, man. He? It was, and yeah. uh, it, it, was a, it was a sad loss. Yeah. And uh, the guy that works for me now, Dan Brackley, he was a big friend of, he got very friendly with Jan. And, and I think this is, it was maybe through the shop that he got friendly. Because they used to do a bit of lure fishing together and things like this. Yeah. And. Uh, but he was always in my mind. Yeah. But number one, always with me, is Billy Lane. Yeah, tell me a bit more about your memories of Billy. Well, um, Billy, of course, was... He, he, we all used... When well, was youngsters, we all looked up to him. I mean, he became world champion. And round this area, Billy won m most of the matches. You know, he was, he was prominent on canal matches. And you'd see him on river matches. It, he just was a, a good all-round general angler. And he... His master of the float was was incredible. Uh, he designed the little dumpy float that, for fishing the Trent over shallow water. Nobody had thought about doing what Bill did. But he was a, a really top class angler and a lovely man to boot with it. Yeah. You know. He was good in the shop. You know, when I when I left Milbro, when I worked for Milbro, it was always a delight because I used to call on lanes in Coventry. Uh, they knew that I'd got the shop in rugby, yeah. but that, they didn't worry about that. I mean, eventually, we we bought all our bait off them. Got you. But Billy was always, always, always gave you a welcome, and we always wanted to chat, wanted to know how we were doing, and and he'd, we'd talk fishing and what have you. So, but uh, 
Great guy. Yeah, and he barely holds the record for the most number of national medals ever won. Uh, Does he? I, I didn't. At I eighteen. Yeah. So, so I, I know I, you started I know, the book. I'm, yeah. J- it, it, my apologies uh, to John. I've got to go through that. Yeah, it's, but, um, so. it's near. It's near the end when he looks at that. Eventually, I think Alan Scott on may overtake. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, is the one that sort of I think could be in second place and Ivan in third. Yeah, yeah. It's actually quite... I, I'm trying to help John with some facts and figures. And, oh, right, yeah. It's very You're diffi- the man. <laughs> it's very difficult because yeah. a lot of people don't remember, no, you know. No. Um, but Billy's definitely won 18 mm. national medals yeah, and that yeah. is the... Oh, no, well, it, he, was, he was number one man. Yeah. And, of course, Ivan. Yeah, did you know Ivan, Ivan much, well? I knew him pretty well, yeah. I got yeah. to know Ivan quite... In fact, I always remember... When, when he opened his shop with Roy Marlowe in, in, in Leicester and he came down to see me in the shop. I remember him, at that time our shop was just one small room. We did expand later on. And uh, I remember him coming in with Roy and because they were going to open their shop in Leicester and he, he wanted a few tips and what have you. So I showed him round down my cellar and what we did refrigeration wise and what have you. So. And of course, we used to meet regularly on the on the match circuits, yeah. and uh, and eventually, when I I used to fish Mallory Park quite a, quite a bit, and uh, it was run by Roy Marlow, yeah. and Ivan used to fish there quite quite often. You know, it was sad really that we we lost him because he was he was another lovely guy that got time for everybody, the most yeah. untidy angler imaginable. But you know, yes, I, I sat behind I often, him one day, and, and I often, <laughs> oh. I often compared him with another man I had a lot of time for, which was Ray Mumford. Did uh, you know Ray? I oh, know Ray. Yes, interesting. Oh, yeah, was, I didn't imagine you'd know Ray because yeah. Ray was a, a no, sort no, of London. No, How did you come to? No, meet Ray? we just, we just, you met up, didn't you? Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things. You were on the same circuit, suppose, so, you, so that you doesn't to, happen, does it today? So much people don't meet up. Well, no, because they all, they're not. I was going everywhere. Yeah. And we all did. Yeah. We all here, there and everywhere. So you met all these people and regularly you, you ran into one another and you'd have a chat, you got to know yeah. them. And, you know, especially if you've had a bit of success, then they all want to talk to you. Yeah. So you end up knowing all these people, which is like you say, it doesn't happen now. No. So, <clears throat> but Ray was, he was a, so tidy. I remember I got, to, I used to write for Angling Magazine. I did the match patch in that for a number of years, every month, working away, doing my match patch, comments and what have you, and talking tactics. And, you, know, you just go on and on, don't you? And, um, but I remember going, I, they asked me to go and cover the, the, um, the embassy final in Denmark. In that, you, could, you know, the embassy final, they used to have the region and was a yeah. The, yeah. the final, I don't know, 80 blokes, I think it was, or something yeah. like that, were all shipped out to Denmark. They all went out on the boat, on the ferry. Yeah, half, half a <laughs> and, shandy, uh, yeah. maybe two. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I was with Keith Elliott. Yeah, there's another name. There's another name, yeah, 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 still going strong, Keith. With, remember with, with Keith and I, yeah, yeah, we were both doing a bit of coverage for, for, for this match. And uh, I think we shared a cabin. But anyway, we, we covered. We, we went on the day. We had to. We were walking the bank and, and watching. And I looked at Ray Mumford, and everything was so neat and tidy. You know, everything was there, all laid out perfectly. And I, and I thought back to when I saw not Ivan wasn't in the match, but when I saw Ivan on the seven once, and I, and I stood behind him. I, I'd, I'd done no good, and I walked up to see how he were doing. And there was lots of balls of line here. There was baked in, thrown over there. There was, <laughs> was a real mess. But he was catching fish. Oh, he was. <laughs> and yeah. that was Ivan. He, he was a, a master. So. Yeah, he was. People travelled. That's right. Yeah. You know, yeah. 100 miles to go and watch Ivan Absolutely. fish. Absolutely, yeah. And best I know, there's never quite been anybody like that. Since, no, 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 it? no, he's never you know, not been repeated. No, whether there ever will be, well, who knows? No, I no, rather, I don't think I rather doubt it. I don't think, I don't think it generates that sort of person now, to be honest with you. No. Personalities no. in that way. No, he was but, a one-off, wasn't he? That's, that's Total one-off, yeah. And then there was, there was people like Benny Asher, so I got... You, was, you I got mentioned used, Benny earlier, yeah, you, was, you, had some, you said something about oh, casters, so I'm going to yeah, ask you about that. I know, that. I know, I always... I always used to pull his leg. 
because casters were a nightmare. You know, in, in you go back to the 60s and 70s when, well, the 70s and 80s when the caster boom took place. And, and I was running, we were selling 100, 120 pints of casters a week. And I was running like 20, 30 gallon of bait some weeks. And that was a nightmare because, you know, we've got no control over temperature. Yeah. And I was working in a cellar. So that's, and you, to run all this bait through, it used to take probably an hour, hour and a half. You do it three or four times a day. So you spent a lot, a lot of time. I used to leave, oh, I used to live opposite the shop in those days. So I used to go out from the shop about nine o'clock and I'd be there till 11, running bait. And then I'd be back up in the morning, running bait again. So they were a nightmare. And I often used to pull his leg, I wish I hadn't started people using casters. <laughs> well, another, another lovely man. It's, uh, I yeah. got on well with Benny. And yeah. He'd always ask after you and him, whatever. I never really, yeah, I fished against him a few times up on in the Trent area, but they were up there and, and we were down here. He didn't get down this part of the world very well, often. No, he, he, no, he, he tended to. That's right. You know, he yeah. travelled to the Trent and then he fished the yeah. Cheshire waters. But it, yeah, that's right. That's you know. But I, I, I did have a lot of time for Benny. And Ian Heaps, I got to know quite well as well. Um, I, I had Ian down here training youngsters. He came down to do a, a day's fishing with, I got a group of kids together and we had him on the canal. And, and Ian came down and gave him instruction oh, and what have yeah. you. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the canal around Rugby, moving on to a bit of a different no. subject now, um, it got stopped illegally with Xander sometime in the well, 1970s. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what's yeah. Your... We know who did that, but there you go. That's yeah, well, uh, yeah. There. I mean, you know, what do you, what, what do you think? Well, how do you think it's affected the canal, and what do you think it's like now, and we're looking at, you know, 45 well, years, I think 50 years on almost? First and foremost, I think what you have to consider is that with the concept of the private fisheries, fishing's changed dramatically. You know, people don't join clubs now to go to to, to go fishing. Or less people you know, anyway. You see, yeah. they they tend the only club in this area that does any good is the Lamington Club. They've got some quite nice nice waters, and they do have a, a membership. But Coventry's more or less disbanded now. That yeah. just, rugby's, rugby's disbanded. Northampton Neen, I don't think, is as prominent now as it was. It's if it, reinvigorating if it exists, itself, has it? actually, has it? in yeah. the last three or four years. Yeah. And we're actually working, I mean, like, funny enough, we've, we've been today uh, yeah. on one of their junior sessions. Yeah. Oh, right. Another club that's doing yeah. well, not that yeah. far away, is, is Wellingborough now. Is it? But, um, oh, well, that, that's encouraging. I think it... But, I think it depends on the individuals well, that are driving it, Dave. Yeah, well, that's it, it. Know, we've but, got no one here but, now dro driving the Generally, thing, I'd, I'd yeah. perhaps from 2000 until about two or three years ago, it was nothing but bad news on clubs. Yeah. And I think finally the pennies dropped with some of them, yeah. is how I'd put it. But yeah. Going back to the canal yeah, and Xander. Yeah, the, the canal, has, it's changed not only from the Xander point of view, our canal here has always been subject to being very coloured. And with the increasing boat traffic, there's about 10,000 lock movements through yes. Hillmorton. It's the second highest lock movement yes. after the Flangotham uh, Canal, I think. And, and that creates a lot of traffic, which means that the suspension in the water is very high all the time. Yes. And that consequently makes it difficult to fish. It, it suits the Zander because they they're quite good in coloured water. Extremely good in uh, so, coloured water, yeah, and they don't you know, do well in clear that's water. That's right. Um, so, so it does suit them, but uh, we don't get many people wanting to fish the canal now. The canal towpath, which I'm guilty myself, I walk it regularly, mm. um, but it's part of our sort of lockdown walk every day. Our wife and I go out for a walk. We've got a lovely walk across the fields here, come back along the canal. We've got a nice wide towpath where we walk. Most of it is quite narrow, so I, I won't walk on that. But a lot of people do, yeah. and you've got bikers. Yeah. So it means that you, if you're fishing, you can't yeah. pole fish. Yeah. It's no good because yeah. you, you'd have your pole ripped out of it. 
Yeah. So it's, it's interesting because right. you talk in so an I'm urban an, an urban area, it can be quite challenging. Yeah. If, if we yeah. went to the Shropshire Union, you're more likely to bump into a cow on the towpath well, than yeah, you are. Yeah. Than a well, cyclist, yeah. Here we've got a lot of people. This canal yeah. now, the towpath here is regularly used. Yeah. And it's uh, it it has become a, yeah. a, a, a walk, as you might say. Yeah. On and the other hand, of course, it's uh, but, a local fishery for well, local people that they. That's right. To. We've got a few people that will go and have a go in the mornings they've got one or two spots and they catch quite well they catch little bream they catch roach and perch and yeah what have you yeah we've got quite a few that zander fishing yeah because obviously although the days when you and i went and, and, and electro fished and took a lot of zander out they've developed since then um that's a long time ago that, dave that, that, that's 30 right. years oh, ago remember that new bolt tunnel oh right? yeah, yeah that's right that was yeah. a long while ago yeah yeah and then, and with him mcneil and that's right yeah that's yeah. right but uh, yeah so you, you took a lot of zander out but of course with a with a lack of interest it didn't pay you to to bother i suppose at the end well, of the day but no what we're really what we're doing these days is we're more interested in preventing the further spread of them so yeah. a lot of our work is focused for example, from Long Book B, you know, down through yeah, Milton yeah, Keynes. Yeah. Um, and we haven't done any work on around rugby for, no. for well, you know, ten or more no. years. I well I think. don't I don't think the population's that big in around I might be wrong here, but you don't hear a lot of the Xander anglers catching too many. They get one or two, but I think they've tended to move on. Yes, I think that's what happened. They probably because it's they, a long, they, thin waterway. Well, they, they, um, they can go all the way to Coventry without they, a lot. Exactly. So um, I, I would imagine yeah. that probably that end has probably got this a lot is, more this than This is the got. problem. If yeah. they were contained in an area, it wouldn't be the end of the world. But of course, the canal network joins the whole country together. Well, that's basically. right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, You've got to stop them at the locks. You see. Yeah. Yeah. Could talk for hours about Xander, but. Uh, we perhaps, we perhaps all well yeah. quite honestly as because of the fishing we've got round here now all the small pools and day ticket waters and season ticket waters we seem to be covered for the number of people we've got, we've got yeah. so consequently the canal now it doesn't become so important yeah we've more or less lost the river because of lack of rainfall they've allowed it to uh, they don't dredge it any longer so it's got choked up with weed they like now the river to flood at the top end because it holds back the water. You know, people don't realise these how the strategy of moving water. If you empty all the top end of all the debris and make it a very quick channel, the poor devils down at Tewkesbury, when there's a lot of rain, get flooded out in two days. Whereas now it probably takes a whole week for the water to work down the river because it's allowed to flood the fields. So our little river here, which used to provide a bit of fishing, now is almost negligible. So we've lost that. Mm. So we get no river fishermen. They no. don't travel now like they used to. You know, they don't people, you know, don't they're not I mean I go down the Avon at Barford, but in the well more in the autumn than the winter. But uh, a lot of people now are content just to stay in this location so that's and the canal doesn't feature unfortunately no not, no, not around no, rugby no, no. in other parts of the country it's you know, no. a huge part of the scene yeah. still but uh, if i see somebody fishing along the canal it, it's it's a rarity put it yeah. that way yeah which is a shame really because to me it's where angling started Yes, and so many great anglers, <laughs> including yourself, started there, Dave. And uh, you know, I'm I'm an optimist. Well, you know, yeah. I, I, um, I think you have. Well, you have to be an optimist. It you? helps, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and we are. For example, you know, we, we had nearly 100 kids in the junior canal championships. I was last going to year. ask you about that. I think that's wonderful. What you're doing there is generating. You're, you're trying to generate youth, because really speaking, we've lost the kids. To yeah. a large extent. Yeah, the last we, 30 we, years. We don't right? see many in the shop. Maybe that's our fault for not encouraging it, but the parents don't encourage it now. They seem as though that they want the kids to do think more family things rather than go fishing. Yeah. So. We've learnt a lot from it, and we've still got a, lot, a long way to go. 
I'm actually surprised, or maybe I shouldn't be, at how many kids, say between about the ages of 6 and 11 or 12, <coughs> that when you get them fishing, they absolutely love it. Yeah. Once they're over that age, I don't think you've got much chance of recruiting them. No. So it's no. really a junior school age. Yeah. You know, and, and we take them mostly on the canal where we're catching gudgeon, small roach and perch. And they come back time and time again. Yeah. But there isn't the club structure to well, this is a in back. most places. No, no, you know, no. there's probably <coughs> what, 20 clubs maximum in the country that have got a really yeah. decent junior section yeah. and coaches that, yeah. are, that are getting people to a, a standard where they can fish the Angling Trust National and yeah. things like yeah. that. Well, I hope you can continue to do it, Jim. Well, 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 <laughs> well I'll try while, uh, <laughs> well, until I retire, and then, and, then, yeah. uh, and somebody else can have a go. But yeah. uh, if we don't succeed, it won't be yeah. for want of uh, it won't be for want of trying. I've got one of your uh, former staff members involved, a chap called Barry Wilkinson. Oh, you've got Barry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Barry's just yeah. qualified. To, he's level two. Oh no, he told me he was going to. Yeah, he was yeah. getting involved. Yeah, yeah, he's a fantastic good. coach. He's got yeah. the right personality for that's it, right. yeah. and he's technically oh, he's, competent. Yeah, he's, Barry. He's, he's quite competent at barriers. Yeah. Work, worked for me for a few years. Yeah, he was my maggot man. He was yeah down the, yeah, down you know, the he's, cellar. He's still yeah. going strong. The cellar man. You yeah. know, we we have some let's fish coaches national teams, and Barry captains captains one of them yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah. We'll um, keep trying, Dave. That's all we can do, <laughs> isn't it? All strength zero, uh, John. Yeah. yeah. I think I've covered all I want to cover in this. I don't know about you. You got anything on, else? On, to be honest with you, I've spent the last week looking at and thinking how this would go, <laughs> trying to remember all the things that I've done. And because, uh, I mean, <laughs> I've done a lot in my life. Yes. But to try and get this, and I'm just happy to think now, I mean, at my age now, I can still, I've still got a brain that can... Yeah, uh, it's all in there, isn't it? <laughs> still got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah.